Yeah, it's an indie zombie survival game on Steam. Somehow it's not in early access. And for five quid, I'll occasionally chuck money into the darkness, then immediately laugh and be pleased with my decision the moment I see how cheesy the main menu is. So, Survivalist started life on the Xbox Live indie market, and it got put into the PC at some point earlier this year. Probably that point. It's got some interesting points, and it can be fun early on, but it runs out of steam pretty soon. Nearly every idea felt at least decently implemented, but it's got a bunch of disparate ideas, each lacking any individual depth. Oh hey, there's contact info in the options menu. I wonder if I can change his contact info. Nope, can't. And the game doesn't appreciate the attempt either. The opening text crawl tells us all that we need to know, and immediately sets about the gravity of the situation. This is a survival game asking us to ensure the continued existence of a hedge fund manager. A tough proposition, but I'll try and see it from Joe's perspective of probably not wanting to die. We set off in search of food and a distress call, and right off the bat, look at that HUD. Look at his face. He is completely nonplussed with existing. So we go into town, grab five bags of crisps. Joe's satisfied, but decides to check out the distress call anyway. In doing so, we meet Alice. She's fucked up. But her sister even more so. Kill the sister, rescue Alice, and we end up joining her in her quest for insulin. Mostly because she's a diabetic, and fuss wants insulin. And it's also more that she invites herself to tag along and then slowly walks to her sister's corpse. And we have to wait on this. It's not like it's a rush anyway. Fuck it, I'm just gonna go and loot these cars. I'll catch up. Oh yeah, all we start with is two pounds of $100 bills. Oh, don't try and give me a tutorial. Get it yourself. Oh, fine. Inventory management and the ability to use hands assured. Hey, Alice, your sister just died. What's up? The hunt for insulin begins in a nearby town inhabited solely by a bloke called Isham Seeley. He doesn't trust Joe despite offers of a tasteful erotic novel entitled The Spanking Bishop. How Joe can attest to its tastefulness is none of my concern. Despite that, I am bringing it up. Alice manages to sway him over to our side. We get into town, nip off to the pharmacy for some insulin, and even nab some guns while we're at it. Isham decides to stick around and Joe decides not to go back underground forever, surviving off of the five bags of crisps he'd found. Alice also informs us of a group of survivors south of here, and so we find Fort Kohai. It's here we get our first taste of asking around for quests, trading with others, and finding out just how things have gotten in regards to Dosh and zombies. It's a nice bit of world building, and I learned the meaning of the word fungible. I am left with some questions, however, Doc. Alice is the only diabetic left in the bloody wasteland. What has she done to piss everyone off that they are so bloody protective of their insulin? Cash is useless and has been replaced with gold. So, why do you want 93 bits of bloody jewellery for one shot? Well, whatever. I spend some time doing odd jobs for Fort Kohai, get some money, Oh, and by the way, this has nothing to do with getting shot to death a moment earlier. That was a completely different quest. And since the Doctor likes us now, the price has dropped considerably. 1,000 gold actually goes a pretty long way in this game. So, we get a few bits of insulin, and Alice, now having a few days of life ahead of her, asks Joe, what does he actually want? Joe immediately has three answers on hand, but he'll only settle on choosing one. I went with power and then the game drops a pretty lofty objective on us. Complete it. I mean, I am about four hours in now, and this is a pretty hefty laundry list Joe's got here. Right, so Survivalist is a top-down zombie survival shooter, kinda RPG, kinda base building, very, very slightly strategy game. In my Dying Light review, I mentioned the issue I have with open world games, is that they typically have a fair few disparate features, but none ever feel as fleshed out as a game that's got a bit more focus. Survivalist encapsulates this statement. Shooting, trading, RPG elements, base building, farming, strategy elements, all present and accounted for with some repeated from the beginning of this paragraph. And each only exists in a kind of bare-bones manner here. 
I try not to let context affect my reviews too much, but for what this game is, I believe it's a one-man effort, albeit one that has sourced quite a lot of shit. Despite that, it is no doubt impressive, and at 5 quid, if this review sparks even a passing interest, I would suggest Survivalist as a curiosity. Okay, anyway, Joe has decided that he's going to complete the apocalypse, and this is his criteria for winning. I don't know how he quantifies some of this, but fuck it if it satisfies him. I honestly have no clue whether or not this is over or underreaching, but it's going to take me 30 hours real time either way. So, your basics. WASD to move, now spins the world about violently. Movement's ultimately fine, characters move fluidly and turn on a dime. Kinda weightless, but it works. And this is handy because your primary defense against zombies is sprinting sideways as they fucking rugby tackle at you. The combat's lock-on based, and the reticle slowly turns to red as your character lines up a shot. It doesn't need to be red to actually land a hit, but it's kinda luck based in that regard. And depending on stats and the weapon used, you lock on faster. This does actually give the small pool of differing weapons some distinction. The pistol is piss weak, but ammo's plentiful, and it locks on fast. The shotgun's a reliable all-rounder, and it's a shotgun. Decent ammo and damage, but you have to let zombies get close. The assault rifle goes through your available ammo very quickly and is terrible, making it fit the bill a terrible weapon. And the sniper rifle is incredibly powerful and makes your pitiful field of vision mildly less so. But due to how the system works, only characters with halfway decent shooting can make any decent use out of it, and therefore it's pretty situational. What little variety there is in the weapons actually works semi-decently, and allocating guns between survivors can be a somewhat involving task once you start setting up a base. The zombies don't have guns. As I've said, they prefer rugby tackles. Getting bit once is a death sentence unless you've got some antis in. Anti... I can't remember what it's called, I just routed it back to dying light. Who cares? If you've got drugs, you're fine. But as long as you have stamina, you pretty much won't get bit, because you can just mash out of it. So, the main concern is not running out of breath. Once combat starts, you are locked to sprinting, and getting grappled does take stamina away. And if sapped, you're shit out of luck. This does create a somewhat interesting scenario, where you have to solve the problem very quickly, and every movement becomes costly. There are four zombie types differentiated by colour, and the only difference between them in gameplay terms is the amount of health they have and how much stamina they drain plus how quickly their infection takes hold, and how expensive the drugs to fix this are. The early game types, green and blue, aren't so bad, but red and white zombies are fucking egregious. How many bullets can you take? It's weird. I was enjoying the combat at first, but the more I played, I realized I just couldn't quite figure out why I was enjoying it. The sound effects are decent, the ragdolls are unintentionally amusing, and there is something pleasing about taking out a group of survivors with you and gunning down undead as a group. But it's so uninvolved and dull. It doesn't feel like it's based on skill, just mass fire. And combine this with the awful view distance, and the fact that unless you've got a sniper rifle, zombies will always spot you first, meaning there is no stealth. The combat becomes serviceable at best, and because ammo is limited, it feels less like I'm fighting zombies and more like a war of attrition with the entire world. And when I say ammo is finite, I don't mean there's very limited supply of it, but it's technically infinite. I mean there is a finite amount of bullets on the game world, save for pistol ammo which, funnily enough, is delivered to you by bandits. Other than that, you are really rationing out your ammunition and hoping it will last you throughout the whole game. It does make finding new gun stores kind of interesting, but other than that, it's fucking stressful. This could actually be interesting, but with the way that the actual aiming system works, and combined with the fact that zombie and looter attacks on your base are infinite, it just feels kind of backwards. One detail that is admittedly nice is that different strains of zombies are isolated to different parts of the map, so as you explore you can start learning where the more dangerous zombies are and prepare accordingly. But other than that, there isn't much positive to say about the main enemy of the game. Combat with human enemies fares a little bit better. It's quick and brutal. Enemies die quickly and so do you. Bring a bulletproof vest. It'll barely help, but it's still gonna help. In fact, bring two. They stack. Early on, it is enjoyable thanks to the chaotic pace combined with the fact that you can actually use cover and bait enemies, meaning that there is actually some strategy to it. The problems quickly become apparent, however. The lock-on switch is incredibly sensitive, moving the mouse even slightly to the left or right, and you switch targets. And up and down switch is what body part you aim at. So try and move the mouse up softly very quickly. With zombies, this isn't so much of an issue. 
When it's people with guns and Joe wants to shoot the fucker around the wall rather than the sod of the shotgun barreling down on him, being picky is a bit more of a virtue, and death feels a bit cheap when Joe refuses to look at the person murdering him. I also wouldn't bring allies along to gunfights, because their AI becomes suicidal, stupid, and some combination of the two. So I left them behind and have no shame admitting that I basically saved scum the fuck out of most gunfights. And due to this, I can now say I solo murdered almost an entire county as a hedge fund manager. There is also the issue of watchtowers. Facing watchtowers is a toss of the fucking dice. And at the start of the game, the odds are stacked against you. By the end, it's roughly even whether or not you'll die first. Granted, you'll definitely take damage. And yes, watchtowers increase enemies' view distance, so they can shoot you before you can even see them. And most bandit camps will have multiple watchtowers throughout the entire game. Another funny thing about facing down bandits is that when you are at war with a group, Joe will refuse to open their gates. He'll gladly set fire to their walls and shoot them, but he won't open doors. Fucking with their hinges would just be rude, wouldn't it? Despite all this, the gunfights do remain a bit more enjoyable than the zombies. Zombies become a chore, but killing looters is reasonably tricky, and it does feel rewarding to win, because it actually feels like you survived something that you probably shouldn't have. Hell, the safe's coming fucking reaffirmed that much. And it's particularly so if the bastards had watchtowers. This is combined with injury actually being a pretty big setback. Getting shot just once can mean days of recovery to get back up to peak efficiency. So the combat does carry a certain amount of long-term weight to it. Getting bitten by zombies is much the same. Early on in the game, before you have much in the way of money or resources, being infected can actually be a pretty scary thing. One of the reasons I can't get into certain games, particularly RPGs, is because I like combat to feel punchy. Even a pretty simple game can get by me if it's sufficiently engaging and crunchy. And for a very short time, survivalists somehow succeeded. But at some point the combat loses its luster and you sort of wonder how it had any to begin with. The RPG elements, well, there are five stats each with five levels. Some survivors have different caps, but they're so lightweight that one survivor doesn't really differ all that much from another. Fitness and firearms are the only two with actual gameplay benefits. Fitness increases your sprint meter and lets you carry more stuff. Your carrying capacity is shy either way without a backpack regardless, but it does help. And firearms affect targeting speed, so it's pretty much the most important thing there is. Then there is building, farming, and medicine. Building unlocks more blueprints, but I think you have everything you need pretty quick, by about the third level. Farming gives crops planted a greater yield, and medicine lets you bandage people a bit better. It's all a little bit vague, and the effects are... hardly noticeable. Much like State of Decay, all of these are leveled up by doing things related to the skill. Then we've got the community aspects. For a start, the AI in this game is surprisingly good, I feel I need to mention that right off the bat, even though it does have a few quirks. What's that? You don't want healing from the likes of me? Here, I'll simply hand you the bandages. By survivalist standards, I am a social engineer. For those who have played State of Decay, survivalist has a leg up over it in this one regard. Controlling a community is actually a fair bit more involved and enjoyable. Recruiting people is supposed to be done by getting others to like you, and this is mostly done through quests or by giving them stuff they want. I basically bribed about 10 people into working for me by handing them cigarettes, chocolate, wine, and Bibles. I even accidentally broke up a gay couple because I simply didn't have enough Bibles to go around. I got some more Bibles and had them back together soon after. This game can bring out the more surreal statements at the very least. Most of my recruitment was pretty much just press-ganging looters, however. Typically, the last survivor of a bandit encampment will just surrender, and hey, I need 80% of the surviving population, and now you're a much larger part of it. Well done. They will hate your guts, but they'll work for you regardless. Recruiting people is admittedly bare bones, but it does take a degree of effort, and in the early game, each new community member did actually feel like quite a boon. The system for how NPCs treat you as a whole is pretty simple, and it becomes even more so when you find a brain scanner just lying about. With the brain scanner, you don't even need to talk to them to know that they want chocolate. It also reveals a graph of how much they like you. Again, before this, you had to ask for their opinion of you, which they will deliver without any mincing of words. Honest times. Alongside this, trade is entirely governed by how much people like you. Prices go down and profits go up based on this. With that in mind, selling people stuff raises their affection for you. I therefore increase the value of handguns by flooding the market with them. 
Joe, being a smart man first and an economist second, did not question this. I had Joe handle all of the questing and trading stuff. All those people I recruited, they were more like a logistical backing to keep one person solving everyone else's problems. Early on you get access to the command mode. It is a very, very barebones strategy view. To say how barebones this is, there is no group select tool. You have to control someone manually, group them up with everyone else by walking up to them and talking, and then move that person in command mode solo, and they will follow them. I barely used it. You can assign people to build. Annoyingly, you can't have two people working on the same structure, which slows things down quite a bit and it feels like an oversight. Another issue is that the list of structures is both tiny and unimpressive in what you've got. Two kinds of fences, two kinds of gate, a well, watchtower, pillboxes, a shack, and an outhouse. Only watchtowers and fences feel like boots. Once you have a line of wooden fences with a line of wire ones and a watchtower, congratulations, the base is now essentially impregnable. Makes you wonder how humanity fucked up so bad. The shacks and outhouses only exist to raise the number of people you can recruit. Farming as well is very simplistic. Give someone a watering can, make them look at a bit of corn for a second, and they get the idea and become automated farming machines. They do have a nasty habit of not liking how safe it is in the base and deciding to plant stuff outside it, because you can't assign zones or anything like that, but otherwise they will do the job comfortably. Once you have a well and one or two farmers, food and water is never a concern again. Wells give out water infinitely, and the rate at which farmers plant new crops snowballs so fast that you'll have more food than you'd ever need in pretty short order. With watchtowers you can assign guards. There's no way to route patrols or anything like that, but it is handy for bandit raids and such. Guards will automatically restock on ammunition and heal themselves. As I said, the base becomes impregnable once you have a couple of fences. Zombies can't damage structures in the game whatsoever, so once you have a fence, zombie raids are little more than nuisances, and looters can't damage wire fences at all either, so the only method of attack the game throws at you becomes nothing but a constant annoyance. You can also assign community members on supply runs. These aren't abstracted either, they go to the building on the world map, grab the goods and return them. With a degree of micromanagement you can have a base sustaining itself while you go out questing and murdering. The game does not abstract follower inventories or needs either. Everyone has a complete inventory, goes through your ammo defending themselves, needs food, water and sleep. Despite how many people you could end up caring for, they actually do a decent job looking after themselves without abstracting these particulars. A very nice feature is that there is no upper limit on the number of followers you can have at any one time. You could have 30 community members and take them all out on a wander at the same time if you wanted to. If you're going on a supply run yourself, Grab a couple of people, give them backpacks, and make a run of it. These are the features I wanted in State of Decay. You actually feel like you're in charge of a group of people, not just making some bizarre claim of leadership by reading tips on a notepad. The interface for tracking how many crops you need, what everyone has equipped, and what jobs they have assigned, it may not be pretty, but it's easy to follow and functional. By the end of the game, I was tracking around 30 separate people, and the UI made it easily done. Scrolling through individual people was a bit of a pain mind, but luckily you can select them through the menu. There are a few things that are outright bad. The world map is impressively dull, and navigating it can be annoying thanks to a combination of everyone's eyes and knees. Your field of vision is fucking limited, and the map is incredibly hilly, which is unfortunate because humanity seems incapable of navigating any incline steeper than 20 degrees. So, I spent a very long time rubbing against the side of mountains hoping for an entrance to anywhere. The music is the worst, though. It's just fucking bad. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear about your dead sister, Alice, but where the fuck is the discotheque? It doesn't help that there are less than ten tracks to go around in a game that's this slow-paced, so you'll hear each of them. A lot. And they're not very good. Or fitting. It got so irritating that before long I just had the game muted and was listening to podcasts instead, which is why this footage has the music, but no sound effects. I'd say the animations are also bad, but they're at least amusing to look at until you stop noticing them and just accept the rather busy and bizarre looking hustle everyone has taken up. This game does have a few things that are worth emulating, however. This is mostly in the convenience features, little ease of life things that you'd expect a game like this to overlook. Taking control of an AI survivor set to a task such as building or farming, for instance, they will return to their task automatically when you relinquish control of them, and the game does notify you when they're under attack. So you can deal with the issue and then send them on their way. 
This also ties into the UI. While it is admittedly goofy looking, it does a decent job letting you keep tabs on two separate things at once. It's a small but decent use of picture in picture. There are separate buttons for switching between members of the community as a whole, or between members specifically grouped together. AI builders will actually go and fetch materials themselves based on what is closest. So if a stockpile runs out, they'll go fetch some elsewhere. Becoming fucking psychic if necessary. Wandering for miles on end to places you may not have even explored yet to grab materials. All around, the AI is surprisingly sod and competent. There are times when they decide that the iron fence protecting them from zombies is actually putting an inch too much distance between the shotgun barrel and the corpse they're trying to kill. And there are also times they'll refuse supply runs because, well, you ask them to pick up some wood, but they have some in their inventory so they don't know how to process picking up more wood and they just kind of freeze. It's pretty rare though. You could just drop off what you've got. No? This is something uncommon outside of strategy games, but nonetheless really welcome here. You have a fast forward and pause button, and it does help alleviate the tedium of travelling back and forth a bit, because you will travel back and forth a fucking lot in this game. And cleverly enough, the fast motion switches off any time one of your survivors are attacked. Where survivalist does have problems in other areas, it is clear that the developer didn't want the game to be unnecessarily annoying, and a lot of effort was clearly put into making things smooth. So, back to Joe, the one-man quest machine. Alice's quest for insulin is pretty much optional. I did manage to keep her alive for a little over a month, but eventually I kind of fucked up and she suffered a slow and horrible death over the course of several days because of it. Nearly every community knows where some insulin is, and they have universally agreed that diabetics deserve fetch quests. Two groups would only tell me where their stashes were if I sabotaged the other, and because I was trying to get those motherfuckers to truce, I didn't do it. So yeah, fresh out her insulin. Alice's corpse was never moved from where she died either. Everyone just sort of left it there for a remainder of my playtime. It served as a good reminder, but I'm not sure of what. Alice herself actually had a string of quests as well. Jogging up a mountain, building a fridge, planting some flowers. I suppose that's for the love ending, but she's dead now, so yeah, sorry about that. There is something approaching a storyline, but it isn't really signposted any differently from the side quests, and you have to do a lot of side quests to actually continue the plot along regardless. Want to work for the leader of Fort Kohai? Well, go own his trust, and the trust of the Fat Neils and the McCoys, and make them stop wanting to kill each other. So I went about doing side quests and giving them things. This mostly involved killing looters and wine, erotica and chocolate, and tens of packets of cigarettes as the case may be. I accidentally caused an old guy to have a heart attack by giving him a picture of his dead daughter, but that's entirely unrelated. Well, those two groups won't call a truce no matter what you do, because the only thing giving each of them a will to live is a mutual hatred of the other, and I'll admit, that resolution did give me a chuckle. This game does have very occasional bouts of good writing, but it's just as often unintentionally funny or really quite dry. I open up a trade route to a religious community to the north named Santa Maddalena, where not much of note happened in the main quest. They were just sort of there. So, now Fort Kohai trusts us, and it's revealed that one of their number was kidnapped by a big evil cartel called Los Seros, who live about five minutes away. Now that they trust Joe, they ask him to go and side quest the fuck out of Los Seros until they trust Joe as well. Bloody hell, these people are numerous and well equipped. They must be evil. This is reaffirmed when all of their side quests involve shooting people who ran away from them in the face. And then some more unrelated people besides. We're shooting all of these people on someone else's behalf to get them into the inner circle, the upper branch of Los Cerros. And hopefully by that point they'll like us enough to help out from the inside. So we get some fuck elected, ask him to tell us if there's a kidnapped guy back there. And despite how all of his quests have been asking me to kill people so that the higher ups will like him, He's shocked to learn that his employers might not be very nice people. He discovers Lou Merchbanks, amateur kidnap victim, and we report back to Fort Kohai. Their already muddy image of Los Ceros is not helped by this revelation. So, back at Fort Kohai, well, their current leader doesn't want war, and some new upstart does. So a vote is called, and we're to count the votes. This is actually one of my favourite little objectives in the game. It's a small thing. But besides anything else, if you are well liked enough, you can sway most of the voters whichever way you like, and because Joe has basically done everything by himself and become Wasteland Jesus, he causes a bit of a landslide. 
I make them vote for the guy who doesn't want war, despite the fact that out of character I do. I both get what I want and don't, because in the ensuing talks with Los Ceros to get Lou back, things go rapidly downhill. By the way, I am actually not allowed to point my gun at anyone in this scene. Just can't. Can't end this war right now. If you guys weren't talking at like two words a minute, you can sort this. Okay, bye. This leads to picture in picture. And war. By the way, this plot is spread very thinly over like 25 to 30 hours of gameplay, and that is including all of the side quests that they make you do to make it progress. So recalling it is hard because it's so disconnected and bizarre and it's not signposted any differently from the side quests itself. To call it a main quest is kind of not fitting because it just feels like a bunch of side quests that is a bit more strung together than everything else. The war opens with Los Ceros attacking Santa Maddalena. This would make sense if I had described the story more thoroughly. They then come after you shortly afterwards. Several of my people died, and I didn't like that, so with the power of clairvoyance and save scumming, I reloaded an earlier save to see if I could stop Maddalena from falling. This was especially helped because selecting the complete the game objective for some reason put a quest marker on every individual member of Los Ceros. I have no idea why this happens, but I decided to abuse it for all it's worth because it amused me. So, remember the sniper rifle? When given to someone with maxed firearms, it goes from being deadly if a little situational to a one-man whirlwind of head injury related death. It took quite a few attempts regardless, but in the end it is more than possible to save Madalena. The main attack force dead, I did the only logical thing. Rested for a couple of days, wore five bulletproof vests on top of one another, and launched a one-man attack on Los Ceros. The battle was hard fought, but they hadn't built all that many watchtowers, and before long, I was wearing a whole nine bulletproof vests. However, a few stray shots injured Joe, lowering his stats and making him encumbered, carrying this much weight. I did the only logical thing. I started putting bulletproof vests on the corpses. Eventually, I nabbed a rocket launcher, blew up a house, and Los Ceros decided at this point to surrender and explain why they kidnapped Lou. You see, it turns out he was infected, but not really that infected. Sort of a grey area. They also said I probably shouldn't take him out of his cell. I believed him because it seems like a twist that would be thrown at me, but I decided in character not to believe him for a laugh. I retrieve the kidnapped victim, take him back home, at which point I'm proven right and wrong both in and out of character. He is infected, and when his wife happily greets him, he sort of kicks off. It's at this point that he's shot. So, back to Los Ceros, I suppose. What's that? An army base down the road? And they might have answers? Well, sod it, I'm pretty confident about murder now. And rocket launchers destroy wire fences because all the bolt cutters went when the zombies turned up. Yeah, let's go have a gander. The remnants of Los Ceros join us, and I immediately put them on farm duty so Joe can inspect it solo. After killing a sizable amount of soldiers, they reveal themselves to be the remnants of FEMA. And then it turns out that they're working to make a vaccine. And then, and this is good, it turns out that Joe caused the apocalypse by funding trials into experimental erectile dysfunction meds and pulling out before the clinical trials were done. Either way, he created a bunch of stiffs. That is just the thing. He tried to help humanity fuck and instead he fucked all of humanity. Honestly, that explanation caught me off guard. This game's like myself at times. I have no idea whether it's trying to be funny or not. I suppose there's only one thing to ask at this point. What's your opinion of me? Yeah, that's totally understandable. The side quests themselves are largely hit and miss as well. A lot of them just involve hunting bandits, or are of wise fetch quests. Excursions into unknown territories are enjoyable for a time at least, and it's always nice to know that more resources are lying about. I always felt the need to prep and take a well-equipped group when visiting new towns. This is somewhat stymied by every part of the map looking like every other, and there's the limited number of models going around that doesn't help with that. There was a woman who wanted me to hunt down a zombified family. Well, it turns out I already did. Give me some money. I had to save up 1,000 gold for a hostage exchange, but the price got hiked. The price dropped after I bandaged up the leader and had a fist fight with him for some money. He kind of liked me a bit more after that. 
After retrieving a hostage, I took her home, but then she liked me so much that I immediately hired her and took her away from home again. I later returned to the camp to murder all of them and get my gold back. But the guy of the money fled, and I later found his corpse by the side of the road, quite a distance away. This wasn't scripted either, the fucker just cowered it out and messed up somewhere down the line. When I'd finished everything else up and had pretty much stopped enjoying the game, I decided to do those insulin quests for the fat Neils and McCoys. I got the insulin, but Alice had been dead for about a week at this point. And I guess I'll just put the insulin on her corpse. No one's moving it. These obviously aren't all the quests the game has, just some of the ones that stuck in my mind for whatever reason. It just feels that for every one interestingly handled quest, there are five tedious treks to kill entrenched assholes. So, I have beaten the story by this point. I've solved a majority of the Wasteland's problems, or really just killed enough people that there are generally less problems to go around. Joe isn't satisfied, however. To his mind, he has not won the Apocalypse. One of the five skills hasn't been mastered, and I don't have 80% of the population. There is a bit of an issue, however. I had been bored of this game for quite a long time now, but I didn't want to leave it unfinished. It had started out kind of promising, and in a way I found it funny. Starting with two pounds of a hundred dollar bills, the HUD, the facial expressions, the combat wasn't great, but it was unique at least. And unique to me. The issue is, once you grow accustomed to all of it, it's just not very interesting. It's rather slow pace as expected, but it doesn't help whatsoever. Once the novelty wears off, there really isn't much left. I did perhaps spoil the combat a bit for myself by doing it solo and save scumming, being very stodgy about throwing away the lives of my followers. But this is due to the fact that bringing them into gunfights felt like throwing them away, not making a calculated risk. Approaching watchtowers was worse. It's luck-based due to the way combat operates, and you're guaranteed to at least take a bit of damage. Combine that with the recovery times for combat, and while it does give the combat weight, it also slows down a game that's already sluggish. I'll freely admit, I'm impatient, but I have beaten games longer than this one and happily so. It's just that there is not enough enjoyable to do to warrant the length. It's not like I'm waiting on something to happen, I'm waiting so as to get back to the grind. There's not enough to build, and no real feeling of progression. Once you have shacks and a fence or two, congratulations, you've peaked. Maxing out the building skill also had no discernible function. A level 3 build was just because of level 5, they could build everything. The amount of items the game has is also pretty small, you all know what everything is about 4 hours in. If you take away the gift items, the pool of items that have actual utility is bloody tiny. When Alice told me to go and get a fridge, I was excited, because yeah, it's just a fucking fridge, but sod it, it's new. Then you get it and it does fuck all. You can put ten pounds of stuff in it, where it'll sit and do nothing. You can build your community, equip them, set them up how you want, but the other communities are completely static. I think this comes with everyone having backstories and lots of quests being tied to them. So the game can't have them be proactive, lest they die and the whole script gets chucked away. And once a character is dead, they're dead. No replacements. Nothing. All the NPCs are finite, so is everything else in this game. So the only threats the game feels like throwing at you are context-free, infinite zombie and looter attacks. I'd have taken blander characterization or a few filler communities if it meant that the other groups acted like actual entities. The War of Los Ceros becomes kind of funny in this regard. They're set up as a large and terrifying presence, but they don't do anything until you fucking trigger them. And before I undid it to see if I could one-man army them, in their attack on my compound, they killed a grand total of about four people. The entirety of their raiding force was killed. Good job, lads. And I'm going to take those four kills away from them. So, Joe still needs his ego boost. The skill grinding stuff is background. I think I ain't got someone with max farming or some shit. So I just had some prick plant seeds somewhere. Getting 80% of the population, however, that's going to take some effort. And, well, since Joe had done all of the quests, that meant he was pretty much universally loved or reviled, depending on where you stand. So those who had no particular attachment to wherever they lived, happily joined him. This did mean I had to build more shacks to satisfy another endgame goal, but fuck it, idle hands and all that. There were some issues. Thema for one hates me. I destroyed humanity, shot several of their friends to death, and blew up their fence. Plus, as I said, some people just refuse to come and live at my house. Come on, you bastards, I'm trying to satisfy my ego here. He says as the people I've just stolen avert their gaze. Neither the fat Neils or the McCoys will budge. So I flipped a coin, killed one lot and took the other. 
still not quite 80% of the population, it's at this point I realised something. 80% of the survivors know what isn't a survivor? A corpse. And thus, with my lack of patience reaching breaking point, I enacted Operation Final War. Right, follow me you farming fucks, we're going to go and abuse the wording. So, I went to FEMA, coerced some into joining me, and then started a gunfight with the rest. And then I marched on Fort Kohai and killed them too. And with that, I had 80% of the population. Unfortunately I hadn't won, however. In coercing some of FEMA to join me, I now didn't have enough shacks to satisfy a different objective. Luckily some bandits back home shot Jim to death, so I won the game. And that's that. The game is interesting, and a few elements of it are surprisingly well handled. And there are moments of genuine drama or worry that come about from nothing scripted. But these moments are so incredibly few and far between. Once the early game wears away, you're left with 25 hours of not much at all going on. Running back and forth, waiting for things to be done. The community aspects and the friendly AI are very well handled, with only occasional minor muck-ups on the AI's part but it feels finished before the halfway mark and then just kind of plods on, adding nothing, and it just kind of ends. And then you get a cheat menu. Bye.